So I'll start with the story. Um, I used to swim uh, a lot. And, um, oh God, this might be circa 2010. So call it 10, 11 years ago. Um, I have a friend, Steve um, Munitonis, um, who's himself a remarkable swimmer, uh, like truly a world-class marathon swimmer. And uh, he was visiting San Diego from where he lived in LA. And uh, he came to join me for a workout at the master's club I swam at. And after the workout, he um, brought out these bands. Uh, they were called katsu bands, which we're going to talk about. And he said, okay, Peter, um, I want you, I'm going to put these bands on your thighs, upper thighs, and I'm going to put them on your arms, the upper arm. And I'm going to, you know, compress to a certain level. And he, he had what looked like a blood pressure cuff there that he could sort of calibrate the, the, uh, uh, the, the occlusive pressure. And I want you to swim a 50 yard butterfly all out. Um, now keep in mind, swimming a 50 yard butterfly all out under any circumstance is quite challenging, um, but totally doable, right? I mean, you, you, you would do a set of 10 fifties of butterfly at 90%, um, you know, with 45 seconds in between and be totally fine. And I remember pushing off the wall. And before I got to the other wall, which is 25 yards away to begin turning around to come back, I was like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. This feels harder than swimming 200 yards of butterfly, which is really hard. Uh, so butterfly is one of those strokes where the longest distance it's ever swum is 200 yards. And even people who train to swim the race at 200 yards almost never swim that distance in practice. You're swimming shorter distances perfectly because your form tends to fall apart so badly at 200. And here I was at 25 yards thinking, I'm going to die. And by the end of that 50, my body felt like it would normally feel at the end of a 200 yard individual medley, uh, or, or 200 breaststroke, which would be kind of two of the most miserable things you could ever do to yourself. And, you know, that began my kind of curiosity with this technique. I read a couple of books about it. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately I kind of just forgot about it. I, you know, once Steve went back up to LA and I didn't have access to the fancy devices, I kind of sort of forgot about it, but you know, recently it's now become sort of curious to me. So what's the story of, uh, of, uh, Yoshiaka so Soto, what was the name of the gentleman who, who came up with this system? Sato. Sato. Yeah. So, so tell me about this guy and then how he came up with, uh, with this idea. Yeah. So some of this is, uh, I'll say, uh, is of legend. <laughs> um, but I think the story that he's told is that he was at a Buddhist ceremony, was kind of kneeling. Uh, and Sato was also, from what I understand, interested in bodybuilding, especially in his younger days. So he felt kind of a little bit of numbness about, or a little bit of sensation that he felt when he was doing heavy squats. So he, he kind of thought that there could be some connection there. Because he was so kneeling he a, and he was restricting yeah. blood flow. Okay. Right. And I think that that led him to start kind of experimenting with different I, different ways to try and restrict blood flow, um, you know, in his lower body and upper body, et cetera. I, I think that there's been some stories that his initial kind of ideas, he actually harmed himself a little bit because he was maybe applying it too tightly. But I think then he actually had a skiing accident and then applied it to himself and actually rehabbed himself with blood flow restriction and saw some what he thought was some pretty good kind of gains. And I think that he really did probably develop a lot of the methods for um, at least the initial way we were doing blood flow restriction and kind of made it you know very popular with uh, studying and, and research and things of that nature. But yeah, I think he's probably the, the one who made it more popular, at least initially, uh, because they started doing research on that in the late 90s, early 2000s, at least in the published literature. So yeah, I think the idea is, is that it, it, it mimics something that he had felt before in the gym. 
and he wanted to see how he could try and do that. And ultimately, he found that you can use very light weights, low loads, but make it feel like you're lifting very, very heavy weights, which is obviously useful, you know, if you have a skiing accident or you don't want to lift heavy weights or you have some sort of injury. Yeah, I had a patient uh, last year who was playing with his kids and tore his bicep, had a complete tear. So he underwent uh, a surgical repair of that. Um, but we decided to have him use blood flow restriction during the rehab phase so that he could get back to training sooner, obviously under a far less load. And uh, sure. although it's anecdotal, I mean, it was a remarkable recovery that he made, uh, which further kind of piqued my curiosity around this. Um, so this, this term katsu is kind of synonymous with blood flow restriction. Is it, I mean, I think it's Japanese for like training with pressure or training with added pressure or something to that effect, correct? Yeah, it means increasing pressure. So it's just a brand. Okay, yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the one that's, I, I think it's fair to say is one of the first, but it's just a brand. So we started using I think a lot of people will use katsu as just kind of a generic name, but it probably shouldn't be done unless you're using the katsu apparatus. But yeah, it's just, it's a form of blood flow restriction. So we'll, I want to come back to the different types of apparatus, but let's let's kind of talk through it now, maybe uh, chronologically in terms of the most insights. Like if I if I was to go back in time to the 1970s, and I'm Sato, and I'm trying to think about how to test this hypothesis, it seems like hands down the easiest way to do this would be to use individuals as their own controls and isolate uh, and compress you know, one side and not do for the other and have them do the same things or do different things and try to isolate the variable. So was that the first experiment that was done? Yeah. the. The first experiment done on blood flow restriction, at least to my knowledge, on how we think of blood flow restriction. So, you know, I I always add a lot of caveats because some people will say, well, if you look in the 30s, there were studies done where they applied a cuff, but it wasn't done for the, for the purposes of increasing muscle function. So to my knowledge, uh, with blood flow restriction, how we use it, Shinohara uh, published the first paper in 1998, where they had individuals that all they were looking at was strength, but they had one leg do a certain um, exercise with blood flow restriction. The opposite leg did the same exercise without blood flow restriction, and they saw a treatment effect, meaning the limb that underwent blood flow restriction saw a greater change. So that's the the first study was looking at a change in actual function with blood flow restriction it's kind of amazing that that didn't happen until 1998 which is 30 years after sato began writing about this stuff or at least experimenting with it right yes the other question for me that's been very difficult to wrap my head around is what is the definition of blood flow restriction um if i were to wrap a cuff around my arm and apply no pressure. Clearly that's no restriction. If I were to create an occlusive pressure that was twice my systolic blood pressure, almost certainly it would imply not a drop of blood is making its way past. So there's no arterial flow and no venous return. That would obviously blood flow restriction. That would be blood flow restriction. But like everything else, you have a sort of have a continuum. So, yeah. um, how do you think about this? And, and maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe the better question is in the in the genesis of kind of the study of this. How was restriction defined? What methods were used, and how much variability existed in the studies? So, the idea of blood flow restriction is to reduce blood flow going into the limb, but not completely occlude blood flow. So in other words, we always want blood flow to be going in. So there is a tremendous amount of variability in how the pressure was applied early on. That's improved substantially an improvement in my opinion, at least. The early studies would take a cuff and apply the same pressure to every single person. Mm. Independent of their blood pressure. Independent of blood pressure, independent of limb size, independent of the cuff 
size that you're using. So all of these things are important factors that you can account for by doing this one measurement. That's, that's how we do it now. But obviously, it's easy to look in the past and throw stones, but there was certainly a lot of variability. So given that the idea is to restrict blood flow, but not occlude it completely during exercise, what we started to do and others have started to do as well is before we do exercise, let's just take the cuff up to the lowest pressure of which there is no flow at all. So if that's 100 millimeters of mercury, means that you no longer have flow going into your limb at all, let's take a percentage of that. So we know that you always have flow during the exercise. So now do you determine that with Doppler at some distal point to the occlusion? Yes, you can, you can use ultrasound. We use just a, a handheld Doppler probe that's essentially detecting the pulse. So we'll look, we can look at it here. We look at it at the ankle. So before we have anybody do any exercise, we just lie them down. We slowly inflate whatever cuff we're going to use because the cuff size matters. It's going gonna, it's gonna to totally change the pressure applied. So we slowly inflate it until we don't hear any more flow. And then we take a percentage of that. So if the arterial occlusion pressure, which is the lowest pressure of which there is no flow, if that's 100 millimeters of mercury, then we'll typically apply anywhere between 40 and 80 millimeters of mercury in our lab at least. Yeah, so, so two points I wanna make, and, or one point, one question. Um, the point I wanna make that is a very important one that you just uh, made is that this, uh, this idea of cuff size matters, right? Because the pressure and the force are related by the area that that, 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 uh, that, that cuff uh, takes up. So is it safe to say that the wider the cuff, the lower um, pressure you need to reach occlusion? Yes, that's definitely true. And I think some people interpret that to mean that, does that mean that a wider cuff is better because the pressure is lower? I would say no, um, because it, it, it's pretty much relative. Some would argue that the wider the cuff is, you might actually attenuate some of the growth beneath the cuff, but certainly the size of the cuff will change the pressure. So as you said, the wider it is, the lower the pressure that you need. Um, but again, as long as you uh, apply whatever cuff that you're going to use to whatever limb you're looking to exercise, taking one measurement can account for everything. So then my question is, when you say 40 to 80%, that is a very wide range, right? That's like the difference between 40 millimeters of mercury and 80 millimeters of mercury when 100 millimeters of mercury is the occlusive pressure could be the difference between comfort and discomfort as an example, right? Yes, so typically we use 40%. 40, now, four zero. Yeah, okay. that's the pressure that we use when all we care about is muscle adaptations. In other words, increasing muscle size and strength. Now, you can see the same adaptation at 80% with a little bit less work because you're going to fail sooner. Um, but the discomfort is going to be much higher. Now, I think the other component of that is that's muscle adaptation. Now, we have some data, it's very preliminary, but some data that suggests that some of the vascular changes might actually require a higher pressure. So vascular changes, meaning uh, kind of a change in form limb blood flow or form conductance. So that's a gross measurement of basically the vascular network. So there's some indication that maybe you do need higher pressure for that. But that's one study. We did observe it in both the upper and lower body, which gives me a little bit of confidence, but it's one study. Um, so, but with muscle, I feel pretty confident saying you can use a, a moderate pressure, 40%, or a high pressure, 80 to 90%, and the, the adaptation is going to be pretty much the same with respect to muscle size and strength. The discomfort might be, or it will be quite different, will be much higher with a higher pressure. 
how much variability is there between an individual's tolerance for discomfort at a fixed occlusive pressure? So I love the idea of using 80% of occlusive pressure because now it's not a given number, it's 80% for that individual. So in theory, everybody is experiencing the same amount of relative occlusion. But if you took 100 people, and let's even make it more homogeneous, if you took 100 fit people and you simultaneously applied 80% of occlusive pressure to bilateral upper extremities and just had them sit there. So we'll do the first experiment where nobody does anything. What is the, what would the bell curve look like? How tight would it be for the time at which a person cries uncle? And the pressure is 50%? Uh, I, you pick a number. I said 80, but but I... I okay, 80. I mean... I don't know the, the, the minute we, we have done some discomfort studies applying 40% and just having people sit. Yeah. So at 40%, what's the answer? It's, it's pretty low. The, the, you know, we, we stopped it at four minutes, so we didn't have anybody who couldn't do it, but you are going to have some people who, who do experience that as more discomforting than other people. And, but it becomes much greater when you obviously combine it with muscle contraction. Yep. But yeah, you're right. So when we say a 40% AOP, that doesn't necessarily mean a 40% reduction in blood flow either. That's right. So those are, those yep. are two separate things. Yep. So somebody, when we apply 40% of AOP, the reduction in blood flow might be different depending on how big the muscle is, a variety of other things. Um, and the discomfort associated with that will also vary depending on the, the person. There's some people who we have who you know, they perceive almost everything as extreme discomfort, whereas we have people on the opposite side as well. But in general, we see, um, I can't think of the actual numerical value, but we have 40% is right here. And then with 80%, it shifts, meaning that the average is certainly higher. But there are certain people who, you know, the discomfort they feel at 40 is not different than it is at 80 because they already rated it so high. So, I mean, that's the limitation of, of the scale. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.